So without further ado, everybody, Mr. Cal Fussman. Thank you. Wow, this is the first time I'm speaking after meditation. <laughs> We're in some new territory. But light, I promise you, I will swing. This all starts from the heart. So let me take you back to February 2008, New Orleans. Mikhail Gorbachev is in town to give a speech about abolishing nuclear weapons. This is years after he's the premier of the Soviet Union. I'm in a hotel lobby waiting to see him. I've got an hour and a half to ask the questions that will fill up Esquire's What I've Learned column. Well prepared, ready to go, phone rings. It's the publicist. Sorry, Cal, but your interview with Mr. Gorbachev is going to have to be cut a little short. Malika, you'll understand this. Uh-oh, I'm thinking. And here's my concern. The column I write has not a word of my own in it. It's all in the subject's own words. Not only do those, wo those words can't be just any words, they got to be wise words. So there's no way for me to fluff this up or fill it out. I need at least an hour to get into somebody's soul and extract the wisdom to fill up that column. How much time have I got? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? There's no way I can make this work in 10 minutes. That's impossible. Cal, I'm sorry. A lot of very important people have been added to the list to see Mr. Gorbachev. There's nothing I can do. Do you want the 10 minutes or not? Well, of course I take the 10 minutes, put the phone down, and the more I think about this, the worse it's getting, because I know I'm gonna walk in, we're gonna shake hands, we're gonna say hello, we're gonna exchange pleasantries, there's two minutes. Plus, my questions have to be translated into Russian, and his answers back into English. We're down to six minutes by the time this thing even gets rolling. What can I do? You can only do your best. Time arrives, and I'm escorted into the room by the publicist. Open my eyes, and there he is, Gorby. I'm guessing that he's expecting my first question to be about Ronald Reagan, nuclear arms, world events. So I look him in the eye and say, what's the best lesson your father ever taught you? He's surprised, pleasantly surprised. He looks up, he's searching, doesn't say anything. And then it's almost as if he can see a movie of his past on the ceiling. And he starts to tell me a story, a story about when he was a boy and his father got called up to fight in World War II. And he's describing this trip that he had to take because, you see, Gorbachev grew up on a farm. And the family took a trip from the farm with the dad see the father off into town. And he's describing this trip into town in elaborate detail. And I'm transfixed. But I'm also thinking, oh, no, that's the wrong question. My time's going to be up before the Gorbachevs even get into town. But the Gorbachevs do get into town. And the dad takes the family into a little shop and he buys everybody in the family some ice cream. And Gorbachev is remembering this ice cream. He's talking about this ice cream and the aluminum cup that it was served in as if it's in the palm of his hand. And as he's talking about this ice cream, 
It's as if we both have this amazing realization that this cup of ice cream is the reason that he was able to make peace with Ronald Reagan and end the Cold War. Because this cup of ice cream contained the memory of what it was like just before his father went off to war, the dread of not knowing whether his dad was ever going to come back. So Gorbachev's looking at this cup of ice cream. I'm looking at the ice cream. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. We're looking at this ice cream. And we're both thinking, man, this is deep. <laughs> Just then, knock on the door. It's the publicist. Mr. Gorbachev, I'm sorry, but the interview will have to be over. Gorbachev looks at her, looks at the interpreter, and he says, no. I want to talk to him. Publicist puts her arms up, sheepishly backs out the door. The conversation continues. It goes deeper. The column gets filled, and it's a big success. When I thought back on it, I realized that if I hadn't aimed my first question at his heart, I never would have gotten that insight. If I'd have asked a canned question, I'd have gotten a canned answer. The interview would have been over in a few minutes, and I never would have been able to know what was possible. So tonight, I'm here to show you how changing questions can change your life. Changing your questions can certainly help you make a deeper connection with everybody you meet in this room tonight. Changing your questions can help you master the art of conversation. In order to do that, you have to arrange the way you ask your questions. Start by going to the heart, then move to the head, and then after you have the heart and the head, it will follow a pathway into your soul. Now, more and more recently, I've been asked by businesses to talk about this subject, this idea of connecting through interviewing. But this is way beyond business. Great questions will impact every area of your life. It can help you find a spouse. It can help you find a better spouse. <laughs> oh, sorry, Gloria. <laughs> We're married 20 years. 23 years. <laughs> they can help you guide your children with more insight. Great questions asked in just the right way will help you be better at anything you do. So I've already talked about the benefits from starting with the heart. Now let's look at the head. The word why is a great way to start a question to the head. That's because the word why nudges somebody to think deeper about something they already know. For example, why is your best friend your best friend? The best questions make the person asked just as curious about the answer as you are. Maybe they're even more curious to know the answer. They'll search for that answer. Listen carefully as they do. Look them in the eye as if they're the only person in the world. If you have to follow up with a predictable question, ask it in an unpredictable way. Always, always, always make your questions an invitation. Never allow them to push a response away. As you're taking this information in, you're going to find a pathway to the soul. Now, there's no way I can explain to you, I could describe what it feels like to enter somebody's soul, but I hope this story will give you a little taste of what it's like. We're talking summer 2003. Esquire magazine sends me to do a cover story on my childhood hero, Muhammad Ali. Now, 
By this point, everybody knows that Ali has Parkinson's disease. This is 20 years after he had his last fight. Six years before we all saw him in Atlanta, his hand was shaken as he held the Olympic torch and he was trying to get it in just the right place and the Olympic cauldron to set off the flame and it wasn't lightened. It wasn't lightened and it's like the world was holding its breath for eternity and then finally, finally it connected. The flame erupted and so did everybody's heart with it. In the six years afterward, we didn't see much of Muhammad. And so the editors of Esquire had a question. How's he really doing? So I show up to meet him, and he comes into the living room on slow, timid steps. Now he knows that he's my childhood hero. He throws out his arms to give me an embrace. I step into it, and he embraces me. And then he tenderly steps back into this big, cushy chair, and he gets down in it. I take a seat in the adjacent sofa, and I say to him, champ, I came here to find out the wisdom you've taken from your life. And as I'm asking the question, I'm seeing that he's preoccupied with his hand and it's shaking from his wrist to his elbow. And now both of his hands are shaking, both of his arms. And now he's leaning over and I can almost hear his breaths. And I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? Should I call his wife? Now his whole body is trembling and his breaths are coming very deep. Tamp, Tamp, are you okay? His head comes up really slowly, gets eye level with mine, and he says, scared you, huh? <laughs> and my week with Muhammad Ali only got more confusing after that moment. One day, he'd need a wheelchair. The next, we'd be out to dinner, and he didn't have his wheelchair. And it looked like an entire crowd was going to converge on us. And he had to move out of there in a hurry in order to get to a car to get away. And he did. The next day, visitors are over, and he's doing magic tricks for them. The day after that, he takes his medicine, turns his tongue orange. We're sitting on the sofa talking, and he just falls asleep, his leg jangling into mine. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's just no way I can explain all this in a magazine story. And there's no questions that can come off my lips that are going to unlock this mystery. Down to my last day, Muhammad's wife says to him, why don't you take Cal over to the gym? You know, you never work out anymore. Show him the gym, work out a little. Muhammad rolls his eyes, he's the wife. Okay, come on. So he brings me over to the gym and we walk in and it's not really a gym, it's more like a museum. There's a boxing ring in the center, looks like nobody's ever set foot in it. Around, there's exercise equipment, looks like it's right out of the box. No smell of sweat. There are mirrors on all four walls, and above the mirrors are photos of Ali having fights with his arch rival, Joe Frazier. Now, these fights were the thrill of my childhood. I knew everything about these guys, even the childhood moments that define their styles. For instance, Ali, when he was a kid, would have his brother Rudy take rocks out in the street and throw it at his head. And Ali would stand there as a rock was coming straight at his head, and then just at the last minute, just as a rock was about to hit his face, he'd pull his head back and let the rock whiz by. And that was his style in the ring. He danced like no heavyweight ever before him. You could 
barely get close to him. And when you did, if you threw a punch, he'd just lean back like it was a rock, let it go right by, and then, boom! He'd hit you 20 times before you can blink, faster than one of those shoe shine guys can buff a pair of shoes. Joe Frazier grew up in Beaufort, South Carolina on a farm working a cross saw with his dad, using his left hand over and over and over again, getting stronger, stronger. The muscles in that left hand turned into a leaping left hook that came from the side came in a way that you couldn't see it coming. And it was the one punch that a kid who could avoid rocks in the street was vulnerable to. Watching these guys fight was like watching lightning against thunder. Now, when they did fight, Ali had gotten a little older. He couldn't dance so much anymore. And he never had faced anybody as fierce and relentless as Joe Frazier and he started to get in trouble. And when he got in trouble, he had this corner man named Drew Bundini Brown, who would exhort him on, who would scream, the world needs you, champ! Go to the well once more! Go to the well once more! And somehow, Ali would reach deep inside himself and rise to the occasion. As I'm looking at these photos, I can almost hear Bundini in my head, go to the well once more. And I realize that's my question. Somehow I've got to ask him, what's still in the well? So I look around and I see a rack. And it's got boxing gloves on it. And I'm thinking, should I try? <laughs> Should I take the risk? And I walk over, and I pull four gloves off this rack, and I put two on Muhammad's hands and two on my own. Now, I've got to stop the story at this point to explain that 10 years earlier, I had gotten into the ring with Julio Cesar Chavez when he was the junior welterweight champ of the world in 87 and 0 to fight one round for a magazine story. It's another story for another time, but there's one important point about it. I was short like Joe Frazier, stocky, short arms. I trained for that fight against Julio Cesar Chavez in the exact style of Joe Frazier. So I could just start to get a bob and I'm weaving, I could get down there, and I could even sound like Joe Frazier when I do that. Like, who's down? Who's down? I got the gloves on. Ali's got the gloves on. I'm down, my crouch, and bobbing and weaving. But I don't go with Ali. There's a big, heavy bag. And I go up to the bag, and I'm bobbing and weaving. I say, hoo, 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 hoo. And I'm looking at Ali out of the corner of my eye, and I see his eyebrows arch like a sleeping lion awakened by an old familiar scent. <laughs> you good. He steps up to the bag. <laughs> You think that's going to keep me off? Now nah, I'm really bothered. So, who knows? He comes up the bank. I go back to the bank. And now I'm just throwing everything into the bank. And Ali looks at me. And it's if in that moment he understands my question. He's staring at me. All I see is this. And then I saw something that I never thought I would ever see again. Muhammad Ali started to dance. And he's dancing around this heavy bag. And as he's dancing, as he's dancing, he's looking 
and he's seeing his reflection in the mirror around him. And his chest is coming up. And his head is coming up. And now he's dancing. And he's dancing. And he's dancing. All of a sudden, he stops, pivots, and... 40 shots. Then he hits the bag. If the bag had been a human being, it would have gone down. Only after the last punch, his legs cross and he starts to fall. And I say to myself, oh my God, what did I do? What did I do? And then he goes down on these mats nearby. Oh man. I was unable to move for a second and then I started to go to him to help pick him up. And he turned over and he started doing stomach crunches. <laughs> and then he started doing sit-ups. And then he's on his back bicycling with his legs up in the air. And then he gets up and he goes over to the super leg press. It's got 250 pounds on it. He's got his hands gripped to the sides, back and forth, back and forth. I said, champ, champ. That's a lot of weight. You don't have to do that. Feels good. I pushed him as far as I could. And I thought I had the answer to my question. But he wanted to give me more. So we go back to the house. And he says, sit down. I sit at the table. And he comes back with a piece of paper. It's filled with wisdom puts it down in front of me, and he points to a line in the middle. It says, God will not place a burden on a man's shoulders knowing that he cannot handle it. I'm looking at that line, and he goes off into the kitchen. And he comes back with two bowls and a quart of ice cream. And Muhammad Ali and I sit at the kitchen table and we have ice cream together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Fussman, it was awesome.